The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat peer to peer. All hey, righty, buddy. Hey, what's, what's up, guys? On, man? How are you? Good. How's it going? Good, good, good. Uh, an another crazy week, right? Uh, it's very entertaining. I'd say it was it was definitely more calm this week than um, perhaps uh, last week. Well, I mean, in tra in transaction count, right? Price price wise, oh, yeah, I yeah. guess I guess for Monero things aren't too crazy, uh, but still exciting for price. We're at all time highs for Bitcoin. It's just kind of teetering there. Nobody yeah. knows is it gonna is it gonna fall off a cliff or uh, continue continue another leg up. Monero, I guess, has has kind of come back to its equilibrium, right? It's uh, stuck at stuck at one fifty again, which is uh, I don't know. I, I I would see that as a good thing, but I guess you'll get into that. So exciting in that sense, I'd say. Yeah. So um, I guess we might as well start with the transaction counts just to give everyone a little preview. I know Francis will cover this in great detail. Um, but it. yeah, yesterday we hit like one hundred and twenty thousand transactions. Uh, actually, that looks like 138,000. I'm sure it depends on where you want to do the cutoff. You know, typically you use Zulu time. That's that's typically what you'll use for um, checking your day to day numbers. Um, but maybe this chart uses a different time frame. Anyways, yeah, just massive, massive pumping in transactions. So um, we're not really sure who it is, but uh, you know, maybe it's not an attacker. Hopefully, hopefully it's just Fiat Jeff uh, making a a contribution to the Monero miners. <laughs> Oh, yeah. If you, um, you want to give people like just a quick background on who that is. Oh, OK. Yeah. So there was this guy. Um, his name is Fiat Jaff, like J-A-F. Um, and uh, he had last year, he had proposed that the best way that they could help Bitcoin was to fund attacks against Monero and Ethereum. And he, he had a tweet um, and then I think he had something on GitHub where he said, all right, I've, I'm going to I'm going to start spamming up the Monero blockchain um, to bloat their blockchain. And then nothing ever happened. So we were kind of like, okay, whatever. Um, Jack Dorsey thought it was a good idea to fund him. Not for that, but for Noster. Um, Jack Dorsey gave him money to fund Noster. So I don't know, I guess we thought, all right, so this guy just, he got his money from Jack Dorsey and then he went off to start doing Noster stuff, you know, which is, hey, bro, that's better. You know, build something rather than go and attack someone else. Um, but it was, it was just kind of like lulls all around, like, bro, <laughs> you're, you're going to help the miners, right? You're just giving money to Monero people. And how are you going to get that Monero anyways? You're going to buy it, right? So if you want all, all right. the Monero for those transactions, you're only going to help our price at least a little bit. Um, yeah. So now that we've got the spam going on, um, the, uh, Fiat Jeff has been sort of resurrected in our, in our mentality here <laughs> or in our minds. Well, as was there, was life. there like an intro, uh, like a recent, uh, statement from him or people are just bringing it up again from, from when he had originally said he wanted to do the attack. I'm no, they're just clip. bringing up his, the, oh, original, okay. 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 The, I think it was a year ago. Maybe it was slightly less than a year ago. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Whenever Noster came into, um, into prominence, that's when he made his, um, semi infamous tweet. Yeah. 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 He, he, yeah, he so wants, um, he, hopefully yeah. it's just Fiat, Jeff. Hopefully yeah, he finally right. got around to uh, to trying to spam up the blockchain. Yeah, hopefully you know contributing and doing research and development for for Monero. We we appreciate it. <laughs> I mean, there are some questions like, is this just script kitty level work? Right? Is this just a small attacker that's that's playing around? Maybe they they've had some gains recent recently, so they're like, okay, let's uh, let's play with the Monero blockchain. Is it perhaps a developer that's like secretly trying to expose something that they know is a bit of a problem? Maybe, um, uh, I don't know, or maybe they're just testing the network. Uh, at any rate, we did find there was a weakness found with um, with Wallet 2 where the automatic fee setting wasn't bumping fees higher as, as the transactions started to saturate the current limit on the blockchain. Um, that's obviously being fixed. The solution for that now, for everyone that doesn't know about that, um, just don't set your fees automatically uh, when you're in the Monero, like the regular Monero wallet. Um, and I think also Feather Wallet was affected because I think they use Wallet 2 as well. Wallet 2 is kind of like the, um, it's the module that does, um, like that does the wallet work in Monero. I think most wallets integrate that. Anyway, so don't set your fee automatically. Um, set it high. And that will help the Monero network to adjust the dynamic fees, right? To adjust, or sorry, to adjust the block size higher, um, because part of that I think is based on fees. In other words, if if you set a higher fee, 
then miners are now incentivized to break the block limit because they're allowed to break the block the block limit. It's just that they have to um, they have to pay a penalty for that. So if you pay them higher fees, then the penalty becomes justified for them, and um, that makes it able to raise the block size overall, where there won't be a penalty for them to include more transactions. Um, but I think all those transactions have now cleared out at this point, or pretty much all of them. I, I want to say I saw a post late last night by. Um, uh, by Tux saying that most everything had cleared out by now. Yeah, yeah, I saw. I, you know, obviously, uh, we'll, we'll talk more about this when we have Arctic up. But, buddy, what is kind of your overall take? Do you think uh, this showed Monero working as intended? Do you think it showed weaknesses in Monero with regards to its scalability and being able to handle the increase transaction count? Had it had what kind of what was your takeaway in that regard in terms of how Monero handled this? Um, I, I don't think we, we passed with flying colors. Um, I think there was a few problems that were revealed, um, particularly with the, uh, with wallet two and, and the automatic fees, not, not, um, not being set or having that bug there, right. Where, where the dynamic blocks weren't able to adjust perfectly. Um, mm. I and do that, think that was, and, and to be clear, that wasn't a, a protocol issue. That was the wallets integrating with Monero kind of having their settings wrong. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. At the same time, it's kind of like Wallet 2 is is part of the whole project. A big thing mm -hmm. that we like to talk about is that Monero is, you know, we develop all the component pieces together. We're not sort of like disparately developing different parts of, of the Monero ecosystem, or at least at a minimum, um, you know, there's, there's sort of like at least one fundamental implementation, even though there are other implementations. So um, but yeah, I mean, you're right. It wasn't a protocol issue. It was, it was more so the wallet issue, but you know, it does, it does reveal how if people don't use the protocol or if the wallets or the primary wallets being used, aren't leveraging the protocol appropriately, then dynamic blocks can't work. If the users quote unquote, um, to use that term very loosely, if the users aren't, um, using the protocol appropriately, but I mean, it was really cool. We, we did finally get to see dynamic blocks in action. We saw it, uh, we saw the scaling solution that had been proposed actually get a real, like, I think we've seen it happen once before where dynamic blocks kicked in briefly, but, um, you know, we haven't seen it for such a long period of time. So I, I do think it was really interesting. I do think it was a great thing to, to see that, um, that, yeah, this actually does work. Um, and it maybe needs a little bit of tweaking, but, um, you know, it's, it, it doesn't seem like it's something that like the problems that we had, I don't think are, are fatal. They're not major They're They were minor. Yeah, we're, we're obviously not the only ones who think it's interesting. We got 195 people tuning in live. This is, I think, a new oh, wow. a new record. Uh, guys, like like and share. Let's get up to 200. And then on Twitter, we're at uh, over like 130 people uh, watching live on Twitter. Um, so it's it's having uh, it's having the uh, a, a good effect here, right? People people are interested. So perhaps the Monero transaction count wasn't organic, but it seems to be ironically uh, creating organic <laughs> organic interest in Monero, um, <laughs> similar to when we had the delisting, right? Uh, we saw the Streisand effect there. That was one of our biggest. That was our biggest show at the time. People tuning in. Uh, we're seeing a similar thing happen now with Monero. Uh, people interested, I guess, in it, in its transaction count and how it's responding. So super cool to see that. We're at two hundred right now. We just hit two hundred. One ninety nine. Holy shit. So go ahead, body. Smash Take it away. Like, smash the like, and be happy. <laughs> okay, so um, let's see what we were talking about. Where were we starting on? We're on the Monero transaction counts. Um, where to start today? Oh, I guess the big headline news, um, not crypto news. Well, the big headline news was that Bitcoin technically made um, a higher high, technically put on a new all-time high. Uh, where is that chart? And I had that chart pulled up. I'm a little bit disorganized this morning. Sorry about that. Let's just go left to right. That'll make things easy. We'll knock out the macro stuff. Nothing really changed with the macro. Um, the reverse repos, uh, like I talk about all the time, is still sitting here at 440 something billion. Um, still room down there for this thing to keep going down. Although, as I tell you guys all the time, markets learn. And so people realize now that the reverse repos were were definitely kind of a, a leading signal of the bull market of the bear market um that was that was coming, that was um, that would sort of last for a while. So it could be now that people looking at the at the reverse repos, it, it's possible that even before this thing hits zero, that markets might top. That that could happen um, again because markets learn and and people front run the big signals that were identified in the last cycle or the last run up or the last drawdown. Um, we also saw the Dixie here, 
where it had a kind of a, a reasonable sell-off. It, it wasn't huge. This is not anything major. We're still inside of that compressing volatility that we've talked about for months now, where where the Dixie is making progressively uh, more shallow moves, progressively less violent moves. So probably part of the, the run-up that we've seen over the past month has been somewhat related to the fall in Dixie, which would surprise no one because inflation basically, right? If you're going to say, hey, infl there's more inflation, the dollar's getting weaker, uh, perhaps even relative. The Dixie is, is technically rel uh, relative to only other currencies. So <laughs> that's I'm sort of um, really kind of saying something that's not quite true there. I should probably uh, take a step back here. The Dixie is relative to other currencies, particularly the Euro, Japanese Yen, Canadian. Um, uh, what is it? What are they using? Canadian Canadian dollars. <laughs> I forget what they use. Uh, I think the Aussie and then uh, the Swiss franc. Anyways, it's like 60% euros. So in a lot of ways, Dixie is about like where's money flowing. And when people are optimistic, they like to get into the US stock market. So Dixie tends to... Um, or they actually, when money's flowing, people, it, it sort of depends. Uh, a lot of times people like to go into the safety of the dollar, right? When markets are going to go down, which is the reason why when Dixie went up so much, um, that was a sign that people were going to safety. Uh, and the dollar is like, everyone kind of knows that in bad times, the dollar is sort of the least bad fiat of them all. And if you don't want to be holding stocks or risk assets, often people just go straight into dollars or bonds. Anyways, um, yada, yada. The, the Dixie is really just kind of um, compressing volatility here. It fell a little bit and often Dixie tends to be anti-correlated with, um, with market gains, with risk gains. So as Dixie goes down, you tend to usually expect that um, both gold and, and risk, risk assets will tend to go up. Um, but okay, Dixie, not much to see there. <clears throat> it, it is kind of, kind of hitting a little bit of a, a boundary here, uh, the lower standard deviations and also this very long-term line. So it is possible that Dixie is going to take a little bit of a break here which would probably correlate mostly, if nothing else, with gold. So gold actually put on some fresh all-time highs, and it finally broke out of this pattern that we've been looking at for like a very, very long time. So, but I mean, what are we looking at here on gold's gains, right? 7%. Now for gold, that's a big move, but that's that's not like, when you're talking about crypto, where Bitcoin off the bottom went up 4X already, right? What did gold do? At bad, might say 36%. So again, gold is a safety play. It doesn't go down that much. It doesn't go up that much either. It occasionally can get reevaluated massively. But um, yeah, gold did put on an all-time high, uh, a fresh all-time high. It closed the week above the all-time and it popped out of this long-term pattern that we've been talking about. So, Dude, so um, cer certainly yeah. uh, an indication probably of bigger things, right, happening behind the scenes. When, when gold moves like that, there's usually something going on, right, on a... On a, on a on a global level, no. I mean, what what, what did you think in there? My the way I'm thinking about this right now is that it's effectively a pressure release valve. So much has gone up, so much, right? The stocks have gone up, and crypto have gone up, and risk assets have gone up, and like everyone's celebrating, right? Everyone's at at all new all time highs, basically, or close to their previous all time highs. And gold had just kind of hung out here doing nothing, right? Like gold made an early peak in 2020 after you know after all the all the bullshit that happened or in the middle of all the bullshit that was happening. And then it just like leveled off, it flattened off and it's just been sideways ever since. Meanwhile, everything else has put on all these new gains. Like the stock market and crypto continue to run massively after, if you look down here, that's, uh, uh, that's August of 2020 when gold peaked out. So realistically speaking, like gold should probably be much higher. This is probably a pressure release valve. Um, although, yeah, I mean, you're right. Like, when you see movements like this in gold, you should definitely suspect what might be happening in the background. Um, right. Is money moving? What what could be did, going did on? Did we there? see historically? Did we see a big spike, uh, a big candle like pre pre COVID? Did we see something in like February, twenty twenty, uh, or like January twenty twenty even uh, before gold had already kind of started a big. And this is a common pattern that you'll see actually for the last two decades. Gold will start a big movement to the upside. And it'll start that movement well before uh, like the big bull market kicks off or it'll start that movement well before um, some tail risk type of event happens. So this right here is um, this is this is March 2020 where I circled in purple for some reason. Usually I do yellow. There we go. So that's March 2020. Um, but you'll notice that gold had already started rising from kind of like a, a very macro sort of low. Let's take a look here. Let's go back a little bit further. This was sort of like the, the big macro low that happened in 2015. Um, but gold had another like final pullback in 2018. Um, and then from the bottom to the top there, that's a 76% move uh, about maybe if you 
I'm not quite doing that right. About eighty well, percent. Right. What now. was the date date of that bottom over there? That local. Yeah. Uh, that would be August of 2018. So oh, go wow. hit okay. a, a local bottom 20 August of 2018, and I believe that was right around the time that the markets were doing a little bit of a taper taper tantrum. Uh, let's go. Uh, let's go where I have the Nasdaq and take a look at 2018. Let's go to the weekly. Uh, da, 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 da. Hey, no, man. August. Everything has gone up other than Monero. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get August to that. of 2018. Yeah. So, okay. This is right where the markets were having um, what they called taper tantrum. It was right before the market started that and they, and they dropped, but that wasn't all that much. Like, so effectively, the Fed said, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna taper our purchases of toxic mortgage assets, <laughs> and it's going to be like watching paint dry," is what they said. So effectively, they were reducing their balance sheet, and the markets were like, "Oh my God, it's the end of QE that has supported us for the last decade now, and everything is going to go down." So the market sold off to the tune of twenty two percent, and everyone called that the taper tantrum, where the markets were throwing a little hissy fit about the Federal Reserve not uh, not pumping their bags as much as they they would have preferred. Um, so, but yeah, interestingly enough, as the market was entering this quote unquote taper tantrum, uh, gold back here was just starting a big rise. It was just starting a, a large movement. Um, so yeah, uh, we've seen this happen before too as well, where gold will actually start a large macro move ahead of markets, and then markets will turn around and rise with gold, and then gold will top early as markets continue to pump. That's just been like, that's historically the pattern. I even have a chart about this. Um, I don't have it pulled up right now, and I don't want to, like, it'll take too much time and delay the show to try and find it. But um, that was a big sign to us, actually, in January of, um, of 2023. It was a big sign that that gold was already moving. It had already started a, a reasonably decent move. Um, if you look back here, um, right here would be the end of 2022 and the beginning of 2023. Gold had already made a, a big macro sort of local low, and um, and uh, it was already it was already moving right. So that was kind of another sign to us. Hey, gold gold made a macro uh, a macro swing low and now has has started a big move to the upside. Um, that's probably a sign that markets are going to be positive, right? That was one of the many things we looked at back then. So um, right now, I'm not necessarily sure I would interpret gold movement this way. I think that it's more so. My intuition says, and again, I, I don't have necessarily like a bunch of data to show this, but my intuition says that right here, this is this is probably more of a release valve. They pre they they suppressed gold, they kept it down, right? They they didn't really like let it get too much. Everything else was pumping, um, and so that sort of again it distracts the 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 attention into other assets. And then now, as everything is pumping and making new all time highs, now gold is you got Peter Schiff out there, you know, like. I don't know, I haven't seen his tweets, but I, I have to assume he's saying stuff like buckle up, you know, we just made 7% <laughs> and everyone's laughing. 7% is a Tuesday for us, uh, for crypto people. Yeah. Then um, any time, any time like Bitcoin, like does any like minor, like any pullback at all. He's like, look, it's, you know, it's done. It's over. He had something that looked like a pro Bitcoin tweet recently. I was like shocked. I was oh, like, did he? Hey, yeah, I was like, did Peter Schiff just say something? And, I, and then I looked at the, uh, you know, his at. I was like, is this the the real at Peter Schiff or is it a fake? It looks like the real at Peter Schiff. So did he we, might did have we said ever have positive. Did we ever have Peter Schiff talking about Monero? I don't think right. I don't think he's ever muttered because like he definitely, if you if you really like break down and listen to what he says, right, um, and like what his like like uh, his logic is he would definitely be more a Monero person than a Bitcoin person. If he was going to, if he was going to be logically consistent um, or if he actually meant what he says, right? Cause his ultimate argument with Bitcoin is that it has no utility, no innate utility. Right. Whereas, yeah, as gold, there's this... whereas gold, whereas gold does. And he even says like, for example, you can't even use Bitcoin to send stuff like anonymously, he's like, so it doesn't even have that as a utility. So he's, he, you know, that that argument kind of aligns with my personal thinking, um, and I think a lot of Monero people, right, in that that's what gives crypto its its base utility is this value proposition of being able to send stuff censorship resistant without surveillance, and like that's where the base utility really comes in. And uh, he actually I, aligns with that viewpoint. If he means what he says, yeah. There's this, um, there's this kind of silly notion. I understand why they have it, but when you really dig down into it, it's a bit of a silly notion that 
gold has fundamental value. Gold has um, innate value. And it's it's kind of funny because the, the libertarian position is supposed to be that value is subjective. Value is relative to the people right. that make the valuation. The, the um, true Austrian, right, believes that value is, is completely subjective. Now, what's interesting is that if we go back a little bit and we look at gold and, and we ask ourselves, how did gold become money? Well, if you talk to people, to some of the gold bugs now and the anti-crypto people, they'll tell you, well, gold has industrial value, right? They'll try and make the appeal to the commodity money. And even though technically gold is labeled a commodity, it's not a consumable. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a commodity in the sense that it's useful for anything other than ornamentation, right? Jewelry. Now, in the modern electrical age, okay, yes, gold is used for... Um, for its low resistance properties, right? In the electrical age, we use gold for, for certain things. Um, but before, say, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, the only purpose gold had was ornamentation, which is interesting because the ornamentation use case actually overlaps significantly with the monetary use case, right? Gold is highly recognizable and it's scarce. So people intuitively understand that, oh, this, this is a scarce asset, but it's also recognizable and it's also kind of beautiful. Um, there's other stuff that also looks kind of orangish, but gold has this nice luster, but it's also got durability, right? It doesn't corrode like other metal. Yeah, um, th so th there's, gold th there's really no other element that checks all the boxes that gold checks. I mean, yeah. the closest thing obviously is silver, right? And then the, the fundamental difference there is that gold is more dense, right? So it could, it could hold, it's easier to even, tr it could transfer more value, right? Uh, per, per unit, you know? Um, I would also say that silver is less recognizable, right? Gold is more recognizable. Like you can pretty quickly and easily know that you're dealing with gold. N nowadays, okay, maybe, you know, they tungsten plated whatever, but, you know, back in the day, like it was a lot easier to, to be able to tell that, that you were dealing with gold. So, um, yeah, I mean, so the, the ornamentation use case in days past eventually sort of illustrated, I think, in a very organic way for humanity, these necessary properties that money has to have. And so from that, gold ended up transferring into this sort of monetary use case but money is a shared social abstraction now money needs to have particular properties or something you know whatever you're going to use as money needs to have these particular properties to be able to fill that function as money but overall money is really just a shared so social abstraction and gold had had the sufficient properties um and its use as ornamentation sort of developed that that social abstraction and it helped humans kind of develop further levels of abstraction in terms of what money really is, right? To the point that now we have fiat that's backed by nothing, just pieces of paper that some government says is, is worth something. Um, but it works, right? Why does it work? Because everyone thinks it works, because everyone shares that social abstraction and everyone operates off that same level, off that playing field. And what's more is that if you're a gold bug or if you're like money must have inherent fundamental value, other than, of course, the problem that there's no such thing really as inherent value, it's just subjective to, to the user. Um, is, is that, uh, is that you've got this fiat system that's not backed by anything, I guess you could say by the military, but a lot of countries don't have a military. You've got this fiat system and it's still functioned for like a hundred years now, right? It's still going. So it's like, obviously shared social abstractions, even if backed by quote unquote, nothing can still function and serve as money for some period of time. And you might spend your entire life saying it's going to collapse and then you might die and it might still not have collapsed. So how is that going to su serve you in your life and, and your children? Like, okay, sure. Be prepared for tail risk events and maybe the money will collapse or whatever. But so it's, it's like all of these arguments that these gold bugs and these no coiners try to make regarding crypto about no fundamental value and, and why gold is different and all this stuff, they end up falling flat when you really understand the basis of what money is. Um, and I actually had a, a debate with someone recently, kind of private messages. I'm hoping that one day he'll, I would like to have a spaces with him and like have this debate live because, you know, it's one thing to go a few messages back and forth, but um, common sense skeptic. I don't know if you guys know who he is. Yeah, but, but, like the, but, there, but there is, you know, there is kind of, um... There's a lot of truth to what the the true gold believers are saying, and I I, I ultimately agree with it. I, I do agree. Obviously, all value is subjective, and yeah, money is just a um, you know, it's just a, a shared abstraction, belief in an abstraction, right? Like like religion or language or anything else, right? Like I, I don't know if you read Sapiens. I know probably a lot of people. Uh, 
I don't know, maybe dis- disagree with that that author on some things, but he, he describes those concepts very well, right? And humans' uh, ability to, to believe in these, uh, have these shared beliefs in these abstract concepts. And the most efficient form of money is just everybody, be- you know, coming to uh, the belief that something is money and the thing that they come to belief around is this, is the most efficient thing to use for money, Right would be would be what we ultimately approach and so it wasn't it wasn't random like you said that gold was money after all it just happens to have all these features so while it is ultimately people just coming to their own uh, shared belief over an abstract concept it's also that they happen to come to that shared belief over something that makes sense for that concept it has certain attributes that bring people to consensus around it, thinking this is money, um, uh, you know, and and fiat, uh, you know, is is it, it it happens through the form of basically propaganda and through government and through a monopoly over violence, uh, but people are always naturally drawn back to these natural forms of money that exist and can't be can't be destroyed, and um, I do think. I don't know if you agree with me here, Body. ultimately, but that Monero is a better form of money in terms of the attributes and features that it provides compared to Bitcoin. And that's where I think, uh, you know, these gold bugs where we, where we could connect with them and start to uh, get them to, to see Monero for what it is, these gold bugs that, that don't really necessarily uh, align with, with Bitcoin but might see the value in Monero. Mm, the problem is that the the primary argument of the gold bugs isn't related to the advantages that Monero has over Bitcoin. Although the privacy thing is, is definitely one. Like that's that's a place that we could reach out and probably find some yeah, common the, ground on them. And I, the, I have the, found the privacy fungibility are a little thing. Bit, like the, the few gold bugs that I've talked to are actually a little bit more open to Monero than they are to Bitcoin, specifically because of the privacy fungibility qualities. Um, but their primary argument against it is more so related to the in the quote unquote inherent value um that mm-hmm. there is no inherent right value. right but that's but that's what i'm saying but i'm saying with monero you can make more of the inherent value argument because its inherent value is a network that lets you send value through the internet digitally without censorship without surveillance right and so that that is inherent value that's the argument for that was originally made for for bitcoin as well but it begins to fall apart because it is not the best protocol for that purpose and so if you're making the inherent value argument with bitcoin it falls apart because it really doesn't have that inherent value there's something else that does it better in my opinion I mean, I hundred percent agree with you, <laughs> right? You're uh, definitely, I'm on the same page with you here. I would just say that in relation to the gold bugs for them, it's about the physical nature of the thing. They're like, gold is real. Gold is physical. Gold is atoms in the universe that can't be replicated. You could just, you could just fork Monero and make another Monero tomorrow, right? You could just, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's digital. It doesn't really exist. So that's, that's like kind of the thing that we're up against when it comes to gold bugs, which is why I really try and focus on that abstraction the social abstraction part of it, um, because that's that's really the the place where their argument falls apart. Um, but they really really want to focus on that physical aspect of it. So that's that's where like making those inroads are harder. But I do think that I have found that gold bugs do tend to respect Monero more than Bitcoin um, for all the reasons that you that you outlined. None, none your business, Doug. Why don't you mention you're actually reading chat zero interaction. Yes, yeah, sorry, man. I can, I can only do so many things at once. Uh, we try to interact with the chat as much as possible. We got a ton of chats coming in here. I'll be putting them up. Uh, none of your business. So we always uh, being a curmudgeon in this guy. <laughs> we got to hit this guy up one of these days. Has he ever show, come up? You don't have to show your face, none of your business. Uh, but you could come up and chat. Um, I've been I've been watching since day one and he doesn't interact with chat enough. All right. Well we have two hundred and ninety one people watching right now. Holy shit. Like like and share, guys. Like and share. I I'm all I'm all about bringing up good chats if I see them, put them up. Um guys, just you know, say say productive things and we'll 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 certainly discuss it up here for sure. Yeah, I'm trying to do a better job. I've actually got the YouTube comments pulled up right next to my charts now, so that hopefully I can 
Uh, we're going to be uh, launching that, that XMR Super Chat thing on here too. So that'll be super cool. Um, and it'll be a way for us to add more transactions to the network so everybody can kind of send a, a mini micro transaction with the, with the comment and we'll get that going. Uh, and the more you send, the more higher, higher likely chance that we'll you know, engage with your comment. Well, hopefully uh, we've explored a little bit of uh, some more arguments that you guys might bring the no coiners and bring the gold bugs. Um, you know, try to help them understand a little bit better the the more profound um, aspects of what money really is, and uh, and and about inherent value. Try and make their own libertarian arguments at them. Just kidding, you don't really want to talk at people. You want to talk with people. But uh, yeah, just some some extra material that you guys might be able to use out there. In uh, in. Uh... You know, towards the end of improving our chat engagement, here we go. We have one. Are there any Monero nonprofits whose sole purpose is to promote Monero as a project? Um, no. I would ask Alaska Ain on that question. That would be a great question for Alaska later on. Okay, yeah, we could ask him, but there's none that I know of. I mean, there's uh, well, the the what's that fund called that that they were using to raise Monero funds? Not not the CCS, but the the, the one magic. that Justin runs, yeah. I mean that that's a that's a nonprofit, um, and they do they do fun. They're not actively promoting Monero, um, but they provide a service for people to raise money for Monero. So uh, in that regard, but no, none that I know of. Go ahead, man. Okay, um, <laughs> we're almost through the macro. <laughs> <laughs> we got sidetracked on gold. That's fine. The gold's an important topic. Although, I, one last little bit on gold, guys. Listen, gold performs the least. It goes up, number go up, because inflation happens. Um, and eventually, it, it, it spills over. But when it comes to bull markets, gold goes up the least. And that's like just something you need to be aware of, right? Gold, is, gold should not be like your sole play. It should not, probably not be 50% of your plays. Um, just because it doesn't, like only in certain small narrow time frames this gold outperform everything else so um yeah just need to uh just need to, to put that out there fiat has tanked everything is not gone up fiat has tanked there is some truth to that it's very possible that the gains that we're seeing now are still spillover leftovers from the 2020 2021 printing extravaganza um but let's be real like your fiat is down a little bit. We're talking in like a percentage or two, right? When we're talking about Bitcoin making gains of 4x, that's that's 300%, right? When the Nasdaq is up like 20% over its its previous all-time high, let's take a look at this. Ah, the Nasdaq is up 10% um from uh, from the top and it's up, let's see here. It's up 70% from the swing low bottom. That's not entirely explainable by the dollar tanking, um, but it is explainable by leverage. It is explainable by hyperfinancialization. It's explainable um, by a type of money printing that sort of keeps value locked up into the hyperfinancialized casino. So um, there is some truth to that. Uh, what what uh, Nunyo Business said. Um, it's just not, an, it's, it's, you know, be careful. Don't take that too far. Th that's the kind of stuff that Bitcoin maximalists will say. It's like fiat is, is dying. It's like, well, it's probably not dying, but yes, they do inflate and that's true. So, um, okay. Uh, there's not much to see here in terms of the macro liquidity. That's the green and the white. Look at this. Um, it's, it's unfortunately like kind of a boring chart to, to look at. Uh, so the white is global liquidity and then the green is the U S liquidity overall. Um, the, the overall like liquidity situation of how much money is sloshing around in the system is basically flattened off, um, which is kind of interesting given how much the stock market has gone up. Um, so that that might be a signal that that we look at. The global liquidity did kind of pump though, and as of the past um, couple months, we're looking on the weekly chart here. So this is big time frames. Let's go to the daily actually. Um, yeah, not much. There's just not much happening here with the global liquidity. Um, if neither of these, so if if stocks level off here. And if the liquidity situation levels off, I'm going to start thinking to myself, yeah, could this be, could this be a top? Um, I have a lot I could say about that, but we won't say it today. I want, definitely want to keep the show moving here. Um, and, you know, we, we kind of, uh, we kind of have said a lot about gold. Let's talk about New York, uh, New York Community Bank. This is kind of, um, this is another issue where we have a bank that could be collapsing. Uh, it certainly looks like it's collapsing <laughs> since last year. Um, it has lost. 
currently 75% of its value, right? This is not a crypto chart. This is a, this is a bank, right? This is like a regular bank. I think they only have like a few billion in market cap, but nevertheless, if you guys if you guys remember last year around this same time in March, we had problems where um, the fall of Silicon Valley Bank happened, which was kind of a weird thing. It probably didn't need to fall. It was like a stampede for the exits, and basically everyone got made whole. Um, and they really had all the assets that they needed to make everyone whole. It, the whole situation was weird, and the reporting on it was weird. And honestly, maybe it was just the thing that needed to happen so that markets could pump. I, I don't know. Like I, I'm always suspicious about the wheelings and dealings happening on on the inside. Um, and uh, anyway, so like that's where the Fed came out with their BTFD by the fucking dip or whatever thing that was probably intentionally. <laughs> It was, um, I can't remember what the actual acronym was. It was basically, they called it the discount window. It's like, not not a window as in period of time, but a window as in a place you go to buy something. Um, so the discount window at the Fed um, offered like massively uh, discounted rates for banks that might be in trouble where they could like go convert some of their their low, their low long-term low-yielding bonds. Um, and, and effectively, like they didn't paper over the situation too badly. They Like they injected some extra liquidity, but most of that got paid back. So the point here is that that window is ending now. Um, I don't know the exact date. I probably should have looked it up for the show. That that window is ending here in March. I think it's in like a week maybe. And so people are like kind of spooked a little bit. They're like, is this going to like are, once that window closes, are the banks going to collapse? I personally don't think that's going to be the case. I think that this bank is kind of like a limited, um, probably a limited um, situation. Uh, the other thing is that these guys now after 2008 have gotten ahead of the curve when it comes to banking failures. Um, the thing that was happening last year, like they were just all over it, like flies on shit and they took care of it. They fucking handled it. And then the markets went up. So I wouldn't be too concerned right here necessarily about a banking collapse. In fact, it could be the case that this whole, the closing of the discount window in the next week or so, if that closes and nothing bad happens, people are probably going to be like, oh, my God, wow, it's OK. They, they did. They saved it. And now it's time for more gains. Um, and that would sort of be in line with the fact that we have extra reverse repos that could come out of the market. So, um, you know, we've been talking for months. I'm, I'm like, hey, I'm I'm not jump, I'm not chasing into these markets. I'm not going to add what I have into the markets more. I'm actually looking for exits. But as long as the direction is still up, I'm holding these assets and, until I think there's a good opportunity for selling. So I really am like trying to find those opportunities to sell. I've got my targets keep moving up, right? And that's a little bit dangerous. But when the macro situation still says up, you say, all right, let's keep going up. So um, the point is that there's there really could still be more juice to squeeze. There could be more number go up here to be had. That's that's ultimately what I'm trying to get at here. Um so uh, we'll take a look at bonds. There's nothing here to look at a bond, look at with bonds. These are the overall rates. Each of these lines represents a different maturity length bond with the lighter colors being short term and then the darker colors being longer term. So the purple would be the 30 year, the dark, uh, the light. Sorry, the purple is 30 year, the light blue. Uh, sorry, the dark blue would be 20 uh, and on and on and on until you get to the yellow ones, which are like three and six month term um, bonds. Anyways, the point is that these are stable. These are flat. Nothing's happening here. We've got the the yield curve inversion on bottom, which is just the overall subtracting all bonds from all other bonds um, to determine is the yield curve inverted or not. Yes, it is still inverted. Um, nothing happening here. No negative signs, except for like the overall big long term macro situation, right? That um, that the federal funds rate is now above basically almost all of the bonds, except for except for the very, very short term ones. This is a long term chart. Um, we're looking for violent moves in this chart. Violent moves are the thing that signal problems ahead. So right now, nothing to see there. Um, one thing I really did want to point out today is the S&P 500. So if y'all remember, we've talked about for, for really a few months now that um, probably about two months that, that I expect to make the S&P 500. I expect to make these purple lines up here. I expect price to get into that band. Um, that that was just like the momentum was there, the liquidity was there, everything indicated that that this was going to make it into these bands here. And the S&P actually did tag that right there. That's to me is that's resistance area. So the S&P is just starting to get into a little bit of resistance area, although the Nasdaq um, still hasn't quite made it there yet. Right. So, uh, again, this is kind of like looking at the overall picture. I say to myself, there, there still looks like there could be more. Uh, more gains on the way here. Yeah, you know, you, you get some pullbacks here and there. I'm not saying the gains are going to happen on on Monday. <laughs> um, it, maybe maybe it takes a week or two. Maybe it pulls back a little bit. Um, but from the perspective of like wave magic, again, standard deviation analysis, um, I would look at this and say that there's 
the chart would say there's more gains to be had. Um, I also sort of redrew some of the bands here on the NASDAQ, uh, some of the pleb lines, which I know are, uh, are anathema to certain, to some people. Um, again, these lines don't take them too literally just know that they're one way to draw a quote unquote technical analysis. Um, they, they work sometimes because people think they work and they're also just good visual reference point for what a chart is doing, right? They, they help you keep your visual reference points to know that when it like, okay, so you've got this big uptrend, right? You, you, we've been sitting here going up and down in between this band. That's a very clear trend, right? That's a short term trend that's currently happening. And then when you break down or, or bust through that trend, you say, okay, things have broken out of the current trend, right? That's a, that's a mental point that you make that the charts like don't obey them. This is not like, Pleb lines are not like are, are not like a hard and fast like rule about what things have to happen. Nothing like that. They are they are references for your eyeballs and to understand when you are in trend and out of trend. Um, okay, so anyways, the Nasdaq has been going up in like this 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 channel here for a while, which is actually pretty steep if you really look. If you look at like the Nasdaq in general, that's a that's a fairly steep movement. Um, although you'll notice back here that the NASDAQ spent like two years making a, that kind of like about the same slope of movement. So anyways, um, yeah, just something to, to keep an eye on, um, breakdown or, or even pumping out of that. <laughs> Both of those would be not good, um, situations where you really would just want to see things like continue slowly, slowly up. It, that is if you're in the gains department, right? If you, if you're invested in the NASDAQ, maybe you're not, maybe you don't own Tesla or maybe you don't own <laughs> some of the NASDAQ tech stocks. Um, Nothing here. Oh, one thing I thought was interesting. Federal Reserve balance sheet has been still like steadily going down. Um, so the M2 money supply uh, is flat. The Federal Reserve balance sheet is is slowly going down. Um, so again, the U.S. liquidity situation is is flat overall, but uh, that's part of, of the calculation there. Okay, macro done. Finished with the macro. Uh, Monero, as usual, you know, what are we going to say about Monero? We love our stable coin. Um, if, you, if you want stable prices, <laughs> stay in Monero. One thing that I think is is really good is that after the bullshit was done uh, and Monero came back to effectively, right, it's like it's stable price. We are now establishing above these lower standard deviation bands, right? After like a fake out bullshit move to the bottom. And by the way, this was actually a W bottoming pattern, right? Down, up, down, up. That was a, that was a very clear w, um, w pattern. Um, but the fact that we're establishing above those... Uh, those lower standard deviation lines here is is a very good thing. So it, it could be possible that at some point here, um, probably at the tail end of this bull market, Monero is gonna is gonna make a pump. That's another thing if y'all remember what happened. Monero's like main primary pump that happened in 2021 was at the very tail end of the bull market, uh, or at least the first the first pump in the bull market, right? Bitcoin April hit its all time high, 65,000, and then um, and then everything else pumped. Uh, through the next month and then everything crashed together on like may 11th so it's possible that um that when we see monero pumping that might actually be another little tiny sign for us that perhaps these markets have gotten ahead of themselves and uh and some kind of uh, correction and pullback is is necessary a larger correction and pullback um right now with the uh, relative to bitcoin's price bitcoin versus monero we still kind of tend to see th this is the rsi on the bottom we're still seeing this this bearish uh, sorry this bullish divergence where rsi is making higher lows um, but where price is continuing, where the XMR USD chart is continuing to make slightly lower lows. So you'll notice if we zoom in here, you'll notice that candle close right here that happened. Um, oh, that's actually today's candle. So it hasn't closed yet, but it will close in the next seven hours. So it's possible that this candle will close lower than the last swing candle close. But again, that is, that's, that's bullish divergence, right? This is a very classic bullish divergence and we're looking at the daily chart. So the important thing about RSI and bullish and bearish divergence is that they typically work better um, on the longer time frames. So, uh, anyways, there's there's uh, there's that to consider. Um, and again, like we know that I think the 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 pattern here is now that Monero does well relative to Bitcoin and, and bear markets. We only have one bear market to look at that, but just given the way that things develop, I, I think that I think that that makes a lot of sense. So that would that would also be another point in our that we would keep in our caps that if Monero is ready to start rising against Bitcoin, we might think to ourselves, yeah, that 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 could be a temporary hiatus or end to this to this big run that's happened. So earlier comment, we we need sites like CoinGecko and CoinMarketCap to display daily emission rather than infinity symbol. Oh my God, yeah, that's that's such a that's such a good point. Um, you know that they're doing that on purpose. You know that they they do that to try and 
um, just to try and contribute to that psychology of, of infinite supply. Like, uh, that's uh, Monero's Mon supply is only infinite if you live an infinite amount of time. <laughs> it's not. It's not infinite at any point in time. Yeah, I mean, it's it, the entire point too. It's like, listen, gold had a, has like a two to three percent inflation rate year over year, and that's probably kind of a good thing because that accounts for the growth of the economy as well. So as more stuff gets made, you kind of want a little bit of extra currency to represent that. Oh, and also sometimes a shitload of it gets lost at the bottom of boating accidents, um, both uh, both in the metaphorical and literal sense. So you, you do need like replacement supply, and there are only so many zeros that you can go behind the decimal point before you start having to like finagle with the protocol again. Um, so yeah, it's just it's not a it's not an honest argument to make, but I think everyone here knows that. So I probably don't need to stop yeah, and preach yeah. to the choir on that one. It, it, it is a little more abstract though, right? To, to kind of comprehend that while there is a tail emission, it doesn't mean Monero is not scarce and it's, and it's not infinite. There's, it, it takes some abstract thinking to kind of wrap your head around it. Yeah. I mean, it's it, the, the supply is predictable. And that's that's the point. It's the, the in right. fact the monetary system that we have now would actually work if honest people ran it and made the supply and the increase predictable. But and, and it, 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 it is it is capped at any moment in time, right? Like, yeah, that's a it, good way of putting it. Right. Monero has a capped supply at any moment in time. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah, I mean, okay. Uh, we we got we got 350 people watching live. We got another 230 people on Twitter watching live. Nice. Got guys like and share. Um, we need we need uh, a Monerotopia live viewers chart. You got to add that. We got to see how that's correlating. What that's telling us seems like uh, it correlates with the transaction counts. <laughs> it's it's been going up, man. <laughs> it's been going up. Okay, right here, yeah. what we're looking at is the XMR divergence versus Kraken. So um, all of these different exchanges, we just subtract their price relative to Kraken, or really we take the percentage difference relative to Kraken. So Finex still, for whatever reason, preferring to stay on the low side. Finex also printing a shitload of Tether lately. They printed a cool billion uh, in the past week. Finex, Bitfinex and Tether print Tether um, <laughs> relative to the market as a percentage of market cap, print about as much as the, the United States government seems to be printing. Federal Reserve seems to be printing. Anyways, um, yeah, this this is overall somewhere around zero. We can still lull at Poloniex for being like super, super low all the time. I don't know what Justin Sun is doing, but uh, you know, screw that guy. Um uh, no. probably not much else to look here on the Monero chart. Same thing uh with Monero versus Ethereum. We're still looking at like again, this is bullish divergence. Um, if we pulled up the Z scores or pulled up the R side, we would see bullish divergence um on, on this chart. That doesn't mean that it has to come to the top immediately, but it wouldn't be a bad place to swap some Monero for Ethereum uh, from a technical, from a, a bullish divergence technical perspective. This wouldn't be a bad spot. The other thing too that I get is, is say that this has gone down so much, so fast, so fucking ridiculously. In, in terms of um, in terms of wave magic, you almost always see some kind of like rebound to uh, to that lower standard deviation level. This is a pattern that I see a lot. Is that once you've got a big big washout like this. Um, we, sh you should see some kind of rebound reaction to, to that area. So, um, again, you know, I would think I, I would say, Hey, if, if you're holding shit coins, if you're holding profits, if you traded ERC twenties or whatever, um, or you're in Bitcoin, doesn't matter. Like now is a good time, um, in a technical sense to swap some of that into Monero, um, with the hope of, of maybe getting a little bit of extra gains on that. So, um, okay. That would be Monero. Let's take a look at the overall crypto market and then we will call it a day. So Bitcoin, um, I've kind of tried to draw some extra lines here with Bitcoin. I was trying to find a way to call this like a rising wedge. It's kind of maybe like a rising wedge. I don't know. It's the, 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 There aren't any nice clean lines that you could draw, especially considering like how violent this one day, um, this one day drop was. How much was that? Yeah, that was like 11, almost 12% in a single day drop and then rebound. Um, but at any rate, like you might be able to call this in some kind of broader context, a rising wedge. Um, I really am, in, in a lot of ways, looking at the 80000 area, at, at the $80,000 mark as a place for this thing to top out. You'll notice, again, um, we're relying here on these purple bands. It's a very common thing that I see for these purple bands, especially long-term ones, when price has a big washout that lasts months or years, 
um, price will very often come up and, you know, and it's making a new bull market price will often come to this level and tag it sometimes exactly. Like sometimes I'm shocked at how price will actually tag these purple bands exactly. And again, this is when you, you take the moving standard deviation and then you take the move, you, sorry, you look at the moving standard deviation on different timelines. And for each of those timelines, you take the standard deviation of that data, of that moving standard deviation, and then you add that to the current standard deviation. And that's how we get these purple bands. Um, but the thing that I want to show you guys here, and I think this looks better on the NASDAQ chart, actually, but we'll see if it looks the same here on this chart. Uh, it, it doesn't. So one thing that, that, that people like to do is look at the Bitcoin versus fiat price, and, and certainly we should do that. Um, but there's so much volatility. There's so much like kind of um, kind of messiness that happens in this chart. So this is one reason that I'll often come over here and look at Bitcoin versus the Nasdaq. And people talk about you know compare how do you like comparing okay the the inflation adjusted value. Okay, well let's adjust the Bitcoin price for inflation to see if we've actually made new all time highs, which is a valid thing to do. If you want to do that, like if you want a simple easy proxy where you don't have to calculate inflation and use all the the exponential math to to figure that out. One thing you can do is just take Bitcoin and divide it by the NASDAQ, because where does the primary inflation go? It goes into the NASDAQ. It goes into the hyper financialized, high risk tech stocks, because when people know that liquidity is flowing, that's where they put their money. So they take leverage or businesses take out loans. Right. Money is flowing. Banks are printing money. They give those they give that money to tech stocks or to tech companies. Uh, and then they spend that money into the economy and then their stocks go up. Right. Um, so the NASDAQ is like if you really want to understand what inflation is doing. And, and and compare like how Bitcoin is doing really relative to inflation divide by the NASDAQ. Because in an inflationary environment, it's not good enough just to have a, an asset that goes up. You need to be in the assets that go up the most. Otherwise, you're technically losing, right? If you're if you're in an asset that barely goes up little by little, barely, um, but then everything else is pumping, you're like, you're basically, you're losing to everyone else because everyone else is getting mad gains if they're going to go spend into the, into the economy and you're not getting mad gains. So... Um, that's why we divide by the NASDAQ. Like that's that's a one of many important reasons to divide by the NASDAQ. So let's take a look at the two days chart. That's that's a nice time frame that gives us visibility. So again, with the purple bands, we're looking, I'm personally like, I will probably be top calling right around this level. Whenever we get to that level, that's probably where I'm gonna be looking at saying, hey, this is a spot to take profits. This is probably where I'm personally taking profits. So if we go back to the last bull market. Back in time, da, da, da. these charts take a long time to load because there's like, I don't know, five or 600 lines printed on here. So trading view takes a little bit of time. You'll notice that those same purple bands, and I do a lot of filtering here, which is why it kind of like, you'll see it's sort of sparsely populated. Um, otherwise, all of these bands overlay on each other and it looks really messy. So what I do is I filter so that only when bands cluster together, are they visible on the chart? Okay, so what we've got here is the top of these purple bands. And you'll notice that the very first pump, the first main major pump in 2020, uh, 2021, was directly exactly to those purple bands, right? If you had taken profits at that level, yeah, okay, you might've felt like you were in a little bit of losses for a period of time and you didn't get the ideal exit, but that really wouldn't have been a first a first uh, bad sell point. You might've sold a little bit at that top, touching those purple bands and say, you know what? That's a good spot for my first take profit opportunity, right? That's the point that everyone is like asking, hey, should I sell my house and buy Bitcoin now? Should I Should I sell everything I own and get into Bitcoin now? And I'm like, that's where it's like, bro, this is your first profit taking opportunity. Okay. If you're a trend trader and you really know what you're doing, then do it, right? Like buy somewhere here on the way up, but you just have to know that you're buying on the way up and you're selling before the top happens, right? Um, or or you're just a hodler. So um, right now, like we've got the same thing where people are people are asking me. They're like, I have a lot of friends and people that have asked me, hey, uh, should I sell this and buy Bitcoin now? And I'm like, man, I can't, I have no idea. I can't tell you what to do there. I wish I could, but that's just, that's not how I personally manage my money or manage my stack. I'm looking for exits, right? I've got plenty of gains from, from the past year um, to, to capitalize on. So uh, it, that's kind of like, it's not a cop so, out, but it's like, sorry guys. So bu buddy, more. you're looking at, if you, if you had a, I know you, you're probably not going to like this, but if, if you had to put numbers to it, you're saying you think around 80 K is where Bitcoin would likely top out. Yeah. Right now I'm, that's like my tentative call. As I always say, like that's, that's tentative. We're looking into the future, right? That's, we have to reevaluate in real time as, as we actually get there, because um, maybe I'll what would be my mind. your what would your be, be your best guess in terms of timeline as to when we might hit a a top for for Bitcoin? If you had to guess, like month range, I would say within the next one to two months, Bitcoin will 
would probably hit my 80k level um and then that could very well be a top again i want to see what the macro situation looks like um i want to see what the rest of uh, the fundamentals right the, the rest of the markets look like just generally take in what's happening um but tentatively speaking yeah i would say in the next maybe one to two months for bitcoin to hit 80k and it would not surprise me to stay there for a while it would not surprise me to go up um float around a little bit up and down up and down um and and then eventually see some big washout and uh how, how do you feel about the theory that you know monero would fo- you mentioned it before monero could potentially follow at that point and have you know having its little bull market later what, what's your what's your confidence level on that given you know the delistings and everything do you think it's likely that monero does see a bull market at some point significant um man that would be the pattern of what happened last time it would be that every like they did the delisting they really tried to to shove monero's price down they did a bunch of different types of attacks um and then bitcoin pumped and then altcoins pumped and monero pumped with the altcoins but mostly at the end um it could be the case that they've gotten better price control mechanisms right i, I don't know it's also like we can't discount like we like to think Kraken is honest and sure I would like to think that Jesse Powell is no longer the CEO there, by the way. Um, and we just we can't know what might be happening in back rooms um, and what kinds of things they might be doing. I would like to say that, yes, the pattern will be the same that that, uh, you know, Bitcoin will pump. It'll hit some some very key levels and some like obvious degeneracy. The macro situation will turn around. Monero will make a big, massive pump um, to some significant level uh, and then everything will crash together back to the. Um, back to the uh the lower uh this lower regression line for bitcoin the this, this boundary this lower boundary down here that would be wonderful like if that happened that's like that would be textbook in my mind and that's like all right fucking awesome i sold the top a uh, local top uh, things crash maybe need some washout time for some months you know it could be six months or something like that touch some like key levels buy again and then and then ride that thing um to victory at the top Right. That, that would be like my ideal situation. Um, obviously, guys, you all know here that this is a lot of speculation, right? I'm having to like give you ideas, intuition, and a lot of stuff that I say is going to end up being wrong. So, you know, don't take that to the bank. I am not doing like, for example, in 2021, when I was top calling, I was like, guys, there's it is fucking obvious. This is the top. Please listen. Like there's so many things happening. I can't say that here. Right. That that is not the kind of top I would be calling. It'd be like, yeah, I think, you know, this is a good profit taking area. My, so here's another logic that I used back in the day, back in 2021. I said to myself, okay, if I sell here and I'm wrong and the markets continue to pump and I don't get those gains, will I at least be able to in the future rebuy the level that I sold, right? After the yeah, big yeah, yeah, yeah. pump is done. And I said to myself, yeah, you know what? I'll, at a minimum, I'll be able to rebuy at this level that I'm selling here. But if I'm right and I don't sell and the market crashes, how much pain will that be for me, right? Like I said, yeah, that would be pretty painful because I've just made a lot of money here. So and I said, all right, that's it. I'm selling. Like I'm getting out of this market in 2021. Um, I'm selling a lot of my stack. Not all of it. I kept the Monero, but I'm selling my Bitcoin at least. And I'm selling my other stuff um, because the pain would have been greater than the, the potential extra gains. And I'll still have the opportunity to buy back this level in case I'm wrong. That was a big, that was a big deal for me. I feel very similarly right now. Like if I sell this level on everything, there's a very good chance that I'll be able to rebuy the same level at some point in the future if the market just continues to to pump. So that's another way of looking at it, right? That's another. Yeah, way I, I, I think of it in that way. Although I never take action, and, and so I, I just you know, <laughs> uh, I'm in. I'm all I'm all crypto. I'm all Monero, it's guys. All Monero. All Monero all the time. Keep it Excellent, simple around sure. here. Body okay. man, fantastic. Yeah, you want to you want to wrap it up? What else you got? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is the regression analysis. There was something I wanted to show you guys last week. It's a different way of looking at this data. So again, this is the upper boundary of the Bitcoin price and the lower boundary of Bitcoin price. And the yellow is sort of like, once you throw out all of the blow off top data, the yellow is what you get for sort of like the average, if you will, like the, the best fit line. So we're, we're above that, but we're not like massively above that. Um, and the other thing that's key to notice here, and you can see this on the other chart that I'm going to show you is this chart. So this is the same thing, believe it or not. This blue line here. Oh, actually, someone told me that blue shows up terribly. Um, can, can you guys give me some feedback? Does blue show up poorly for you on on these screens? If it does, I will stop using. I mean, blue we, as a color. We we could see it. White white is better. 
Okay, I'll I'll start using higher contrast. You know, another thing I said I wanted to do, to, I told myself uh, was to zoom in more, um, because yeah, YouTube doesn't have the best resolution always. Okay, so this bottom chart here, this is the same thing as that other chart. This is the Bitcoin regression analysis, except for what you do here is you take this yellow line and you subtract the price from the yellow line. So this is this is basically your error, right? This is what is how far away is Bitcoin price from the modeled price. Um, hopefully that makes sense, right? So when Bitcoin price is above the yellow line, when it's when it's above the overall model, then price is going to be positive here um, on this chart. And obviously when it's below the yellow line, then it's going to be below the zero point of this chart. So you'll be able to see right here um, that line that I just dropped. Uh, let's make that line a little bit more prominent. There we go. That dotted line on the bottom there, that's the zero point, right? So anytime we're above that line, we're above the model. And then obviously these are the blow-off tops. One thing that you'll notice here is that these blow-off tops, they're curving down, right? It's like the blow-off tops are getting lower and lower and lower each time. The reason for this is because the upper boundary of the Bitcoin price is a different form of equation than the lower boundary. And this is the critical insight that Basically, everyone that I've seen tried to do a Bitcoin regression analysis like the Rainbow Log or um, or Ben Cohen, and especially, I won't even mention the other guy, screw that guy. Um, ben Cohen, though, has, has a pretty decent model, but he's still missing the key aspect that the upper boundary has a different equation and a different form of equation than the lower boundary. So mm -hmm. what we're seeing here is that the, the blow-off tops Press. are getting lower and lower. And you can see I've like sort of drawn this um, this this curve there. So you would kind of expect that potentially, like if we're hitting this area right here, that would also, again, be potentially another blow-off top. Now, technically, this area right here would be around 140000 at the moment. So um, mm -hmm. I don't think we're going to get that high without some kind of major washout. Um, maybe we'll get that high like next year. Maybe we'll get that high towards the end of the year, something like that. But I don't I don't think we'll get that high. Uh, but anyways, like this is, this is just another way of looking at that regression analysis. It's a good way of sort of visualizing where we are overall. Um, and you'll notice, like, yes, we're high, but we're not like crazy, crazy, crazy high in terms of um, – in, in terms of the Bitcoin regression. So um, just wanted to throw that at you. Um, oh, last thing I'll say here today is that I'm going to repost. So I posted the regression analysis as a public script, and I posted the um, the price divergences, the Monero price divergences on different exchanges. And TradingView removed those scripts. Um, so they did the thing that the first thing they did was like, cite a bunch of rules at me and be like, you violated these rules. And I'm like, that's like a page, it's a wall of text, bro. Uh, but they finally got back to me and they were, they said, um, it's because, so apparently in, in the scripts, I actually put my telegram at, which is no, no, you're not allowed to do that. Um, you're allowed to put, <laughs> apparently you're allowed to put your telegram at in your signature line, but you're not allowed to have it in the code. So I don't know. I'm going to, I guess I have to remove that. And then um, they like they want some kind of master's dissertation on every single script that you post. So you have to write a shitload of text about what the script does. Um, so I, I, I'm going to do that here probably this week. Um, just haven't gotten around to it. But I'll repost these scripts. I'll, re I'll republish these scripts so that everyone can take a look at the um, at the Monero price divergences and uh, and of course the Bitcoin regression analysis so that you can you know keep your bearings on on where we at on where we are at for every cycle. Um, so yeah, that, that's what happened there. It, it wasn't quite as nefarious as uh, as I would you know maybe have suspected on trading view. Although I've seen some other people talk about some stuff. So uh, when it comes to corporate stuff, I always and especially when they're trying to, to do social media stuff, um, I always um, I always like sort of default at least halfway to being like, okay, what what are they doing in the background really though? Because they're a corporation and and it's freaking economic warfare out there. So what are they what are they really doing? What's their what's their real motivations? Anyways, um I'm gonna republish these scripts. Hopefully they won't get removed again. Um and then you guys will be able to enjoy enjoy them. Although I don't publish the wave magic stuff. I, I keep yeah, so, so pe the best. people are asking where where can they see your charts? Where, I guess they, you, you can't up, right now. Again. Okay. You, you okay. can't. So you, you, know, you, you can't see my charts right now. You're not able to access these um these scripts. Um, because I published for them in a small Monero fee. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I don't. I don't charge. I refuse to charge um, for for any of these things. I, this I am guy, like caught this in, guy. You, you're too good to us, buddy. You're too magic, good to us. Though. What's that? I am. I am kind of like conflicted on the wave magic, though. So the wave magic mm. being um, being these lines here. Uh, let me zoom in. Maybe I don't know if y'all can see how well y'all can see these, but um, it's it's basically. It, the low resolution on YouTube doesn't make these charts look as beautiful as they actually are. But when you see this chart on a full resolution, you're like, wow, this is this is amazing. 
Um, this is just overlaying all of this, the moving standard deviations and all of the moving averages and then seeing how they cluster together. And those clusters are effectively psychological points in my mind. Um, I have long thought about selling this, about like selling access to this indicator. This was something that took me um, probably, I mean, the bulk of it took me a few months to develop, but really it took me a year overall of thinking about it and redoing it and uh, playing with the transparencies on the lines, et cetera, and, and the developing filtering. It took me almost a year to fully develop this thing, and um, it's been very, very useful for me. Um, oh, at wow. some point, I do want to leave trading behind, and I do want to basically become a hodler, um, and I want to work on other projects and not really not pay much attention to price anymore. In which case, um, I would like to sell this tool to people that would like to use it, but um, I'm very conflicted about being the guy that sells fucking indicators. I've, I've always kind of been um, outspoken against people that sell trading courses and, and special indicators, but this is unique. This doesn't exist in the world anywhere. Um, I've never seen. I mean, this the, I, I don't. I don't see anything wrong with that, man. You're 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 selling. You know, it's you're, you're giving people access to a tool. They don't they don't have to buy it from you. You're not scamming them in any way. If they see val <laughs> if they see value in it, they could, they could pay you for it. Uh, yeah. I mean, you're, you're open source in pretty much every other way, right? You're putting all your information out there. Uh, if they want this added feature, access to this tool that you put a lot of time invested a lot of time in and building. I don't see why you should feel uh, morally conflicted about that in any way. Well, I definitely don't feel morally conflicted about it, but there's kind of like the ethical consideration in my mind because I do think that the world is a better place. It's unfortunate that the easiest way to make money is in a hyper-financialized casino and then learning that casino and playing it, um, at, at least you know from my perspective. Um, that it would, I would have to spend another 20 minutes <laughs> uh, pontificating about my sort of... Um, ethical hangups about whether or not I should, I should, um, sell this indicator or not. Um, but maybe, you know, maybe that's for a different time, but it's all right, man. Wait, one, one last point. One, one last point. Uh, I saw you, uh, trying to enter into a, a bet with Peter McCormick on the, on the price of Bitcoin or something. <laughs> what was that all about? Oh my God. Um, so Peter posted something about, he's like, I, I'll give you five, some other guy is like, I'll give you five to one odds that Bitcoin will hit a hundred thousand by the end of 2024. And he wanted to do a hundred thousand dollar bet. So if Peter loses, he would pay a hundred thousand dollars if Bitcoin does not hit a hundred. So Bitcoin does not hit a price of a hundred thousand dollars. Peter was going to pay a hundred thousand dollars to the counterparty of this, of this bet. Um, but, um, if the other guy loses, he would only have to pay 20,000, right? That's what five to one mm -hmm. odds means. And I was like, oh, my God, this is how retarded can you be? And, and and so Peter's like, where did you go, bro? I wanted to make this bet and we can escrow it and we can get the lawyers involved to make sure that, uh, you know, that that both of us pay whatever. And so nothing came of that. And I was like, I my first post was I'm your Huckleberry, uh, you know. Uh, but of course, he didn't see that. And then someone else like referenced it. So a couple of days ago, I was like, Peter. I will 100% take this bet with you. Please contact me because <laughs> here's the problem. This is, I, I can't even begin to describe how mathematically retarded this is. Okay. Bitcoin is currently at 70,000. Um, what do you do? You take this bet with Peter on five to one odds and you buy a Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. If Bitcoin hits a hundred thousand dollars, that means that I have $30,000 of profit. I pay Peter 20 and keep the other 10 for myself. <laughs> if I win, I still have a Bitcoin. Uh, and then Peter owes me $100,000, right? Even if Bitcoin goes to zero, right? Let's suppose Bitcoin goes to zero and I lost $70,000. Peter still has to pay me a hundred. So that's $30,000 of pure profit. Buys, there is no way you can Bitcoin. lose this bet. <laughs> it is impossible to lose this bet. That's fantastic. I so love it. probably someone told him that and he eventually figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, awesome, man. Fantastic as always. Um, can you, can you stick around? Because you also brought up some great points on Twitter with regards to potential solutions for eliminating spam on, on the Monero network. Hopefully oh, yeah. you can stick yeah, around. I, definitely, and, uh... I want to hear Artic's, uh, like his right. take on that. It's it's not perfect. There's problems. Like there's yeah, It's, it's cool, really cool like idea. a very broad idea that would need to be refined and the numbers would have to be run. But I think it's worth talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, man. Anything, anything else? Uh, are, we, are we good? No, no, I think that's it. Man, this just feels felt, felt like a marathon already. We still yeah, got like three times more to go. 336 live listeners, 250 yeah, yeah. live listeners on Twitter. Dude, that's that's crazy. 
We're at like over over 500 live listeners. Um, we're, we're approaching the you know essentially the thousand mark. Yeah, okay. you got you got to add this as a chart. The uh, Monerotopia live views and subscribers. <laughs> We'll have to perform um, some TA, some wave I, magic. I'd also, that. I'd also like to see a correlation between Monero's price and the street price of cocaine. I was doing some Googling, and it's, <laughs> I don't know, man. It's it might be something you want to look into on a chart. Bring it up next uh, time. Where the hell am I going to find the street price? I guess I got to get on the dark nets. Maybe someone. Yeah, you got to start collecting some data, man. Man, now I have All a right, reason to actually get on the dark webs and talk to some of these vendors. <laughs> stick, stick around, please, if you can. We're going to yeah, bring. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna bring up Arctic Mine. I think we'll, we'll bring him up now because he's waiting patiently. I really I really want to get to him. And uh, yeah, buddy, please stick around if you can, so you can engage with that. Cool. All right, I'll talk to you guys later. All right, thank you, buddy. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.